Good evening, everyone. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Mara Liason to all of you. I have listened for years to her analyses of the political situations in Washington, D.C. She has worked at NPR since 1985 and at Fox News Channel since 1997. What has always attracted me to her reporting is her even-handed, totally rational <laughs> opinions. Her no-nonsense voice is unmistakable. Even if I don't hear the program's anchor, introducer, I <clears throat> know it's Mara Liason from her voice. Mara is the national political correspondent for NPR. She has covered every presidential campaign since 1992. <clears throat> she was a White House correspondent during Clinton's presidency. During that time, she won the White House Correspondent Association's Award for new daily news coverage in 1994, 95, and 97. She had a leave of absence from NPR to attend Columbia University on a, uh, as a recipient of a Knight Badgett Fellowship in Economics and Business Journalism. Prior to NPR, she was a freelance radio and TV reporter in San Francisco. Mara was also a <clears throat> managing editor and anchor for California Edition, a California PR news program. She was a print journalist for uh, Vineyard Gazette and Martha's Vineyard. She is a graduate of Brown University with a bachelor's degree in American history. We are fortunate to have Ms. Liason here to speak about a view from Washington. Please welcome Mara Liason. Thank you for that really nice introduction. I started at NPR when I was 10. <laughs> um, I am really happy to be here, and I know the purpose of this gathering is to discuss how we can find common ground in an increasingly divided society. So I need to ask one question right off the bat. Why would you ask someone who covers national politics to speak about this topic? <laughs> I must be at the wrong gathering. <laughs> Um, normally, I do talk about what's happening in Washington and politics and the next election cycle and legislation on Capitol Hill, but we can talk about some of that in the Q&A, but I'm going to stick to the theme of your gathering tonight. I am very grateful, however, that you've given me the opportunity to take a break from my regularly scheduled programming when, depending on what day it is, I am not really sure whether I am covering the House of Cards, the West Wing, the Sopranos, or King Lear. Um, anyway, as I said, I do cover politics, which I know to so many people is a dirty word. But as you all know, politics comes from the Greek word polis, which means many, and tix, which means blood-sucking insects. <laughs> And all politics really is, is a nonviolent way of working out our differences. In many places around the world, there are no politics. People shoot each other when they disagree. And so politics, however imperfect and messy and infuriating, is an alternative to warfare. And I would argue tonight that finding common ground is not just about being nicer or more civil to each other, although that would be nicer, but rather civility and civic virtues are the key to a better politics. And even more important to a functioning liberal, that small l, democracy. Ever since Donald Trump got elected, I have found myself thinking about what makes a functioning liberal democracy and why the United States had the very best, strongest liberal democracy the world has ever seen. Right now, I think all of our democratic institutions are undergoing a kind of stress test. All of the things that are supposed to bind us together and make it possible to find common ground are under tremendous pressure. 
And I think the burden and responsibilities of being a citizen of the United States of America are greater today than they have ever been before. You've heard a lot about American exceptionalism over the years. America is a shining city on the hill. Well, there are a lot of reasons why that's true and for over 200 years why so many people wanted to come here. First off, America was based in the Enlightenment. Our founding fathers believed in science and humanism. They believed that people could discern the truth. They didn't have to be told by their rulers what was true or not, what was fake news or not. And in America, nationalism is also uniquely defined. It's not based on ethnic heritage or some blood and soil connection as it is in so many places around the world. In America, nationalism is based on shared values like tolerance and respect and fairness and equality under the law. And that's why people from all different races and backgrounds come here and are welcomed and become Americans. So even though we have all, all of us have our own separate identities and backgrounds, we have one overarching identity. We are Americans. We also have a unique system of governance. In America, we don't just have elections. We have all these democratic institutions that make us more free than other countries. And those institutions work because we also have norms and customs that aren't written laws, but they are part of the way we conduct ourselves in the public sphere, and they make democracy work too. And the norms I'm talking about are self-restraint, respect, even shame. All those things help us maintain a civil society. We try to be respectful to people with opposing views. We don't demean people who are different from us or de demonize our opponents or casually encourage violence against people we disagree with. We try to be honest. We try not to lie, or at least we try not to lie all the time. <laughs> we believe there is such a thing as facts and that it's a good idea to find them first and then form our opinions rather than the other way around. We try to be courteous, we try to uphold the simple rules of decorum that we spent years begging our children to follow. So we recoil from the president when he is casually cruel or misogynistic, and we don't like it when the president's opponents become mirror images of him and start dropping the F-bomb to show their street cred or their populist bona fides. So civility, restraint, Moderation when possible, compromise when necessary. All of those virtues are the foundation of a founding, of a functioning liberal democracy. And those virtues are necessary to support our strong democratic institutions. Institutions that are supposed to frustrate the ambitions of anyone with authoritarian tendencies. So we have democratic institutions and we have democratic values like freedom of speech that's why you can stand in front of the white house with a sign and not get arrested but it's also why we show some sensible restraint without being overly sensitive snowflakes when we exercise our right to free speech we have a free press which means no one in the government tells me what i can write or say on the radio we have an independent judiciary, which means everyone is equal under the law. Everyone, rich or poor, powerful or weak, is supposed to be subject to the same rules. That's the rule of law. And we have checks and balances, co-equal branches of government, that if they work the way our founders intended them to, no one branch of government, the president or the Supreme Court or the Congress, can get too powerful. And that can be very frustrating. And it was meant to be a little frustrating because too often the system is gridlocked and stuck. It doesn't get anything done. But the idea of checks and balances, at least in the Congress, was meant to force a certain amount of compromise and bipartisanship. It was meant to make sure that the minority party had rights and no one party or person or branch of government could rule without some amount of buy-in from the rest of government or from the minority party, because that way we are forced to work for some kind of consensus. So I mentioned that right now our democratic institutions are undergoing a real stress test. Let's take a look at how a couple of them are doing. First, Congress, I would give them a mixed grade. 
Uh, it's probably unrealistic that a Congress of the president's own party would hold that president accountable in the way an opposition Congress might. But there are investigations under going on in Congress right now. There are even bipartisan ones. But you still have a trend, especially in the Senate, where the rights of the minority party are being chipped away. The filibuster, for example, is something that was supposed to force the parties to find some common ground, not be abused as an instrument of gridlock. But the filibuster is disappearing little by little. The transformation of the Senate now into a body that, where collegiality and compromise were possible into something that looks a lot more like the ma simple majority rule of the House of Representatives started long before Donald Trump was elected, but it's accelerating. Okay, next democratic institution, the judiciary. It has come under tremendous fire from President Trump. He's disparaged individual judges. He has told us that if there is a terrorist attack, the entire court system should be blamed. But I would say that the judiciary, the court system, judges, even the FBI for that matter, are functioning as they should. They're not intimidated, they're acting just as independently as the founders expect them, expected them to do, at least so far, to uphold the rule of law. Then there's the press, the media, or at least the mainstream media, and that, us, we, I don't like to talk about one thing that's the media because we're not one thing, we're very diverse, but we in the mainstream media have become the president's favorite enemy. All presidents hate the press. They hate their press coverage. But Donald Trump has taken this to a whole new level. His attacks are vicious and unusual and sometimes they are really personal. The president wants to have a war with the media. Now, some of his reactions are spontaneous and visceral, but there's also an explicit strategy at work. Whether it's an attack on a female journalist for a facelift, a myth mythical facelift, by the way, um, or a fake wrestling match, a video of a fake wrestling match with a CNN logo, it's about saying, believe me, not them. It's about delegitimizing the press, saying that all the media lies, except for a few favored outlets. It's a conscious strategy to undercut a fundamental pillar of democracy. Now, at the same time, I don't believe the journalists should be whiners. When you think about it, we might have less access at the White House than we're used to, but in one very unusual way, President Trump is the most accessible president in American history because his psyche is totally accessible every morning between 6 a.m. and 7.30. He tells us what he's thinking seconds after he thinks it, as fast as he can type it into his Twitter account, and no one, there's no filter, no one is editing that. So we have a bird's eye view into his subconscious. At the same time, when we go to a Trump rally and see that guy with the t-shirt that says, rope, tree, journalist, some assembly required, that's meant to be intimidating. And that happened. And that's happened, that and worse has happened to my colleagues uh, out on the road. So the big question for Donald Trump and the press, is he different in degree or kind from previous presidents who have gone after the media? I think there are a couple of clear tests of that. Does he really move to change the libel laws? Will he use the antitrust division of the Justice Department to block a merger between Time Warner and Comcast? Time Warner is the parent of CNN, his favorite press punching bag. So far, I would say in terms of the stress test, we are just trying to do our jobs and some of us are doing a really good job. Uh, although the press isn't one monolithic thing, we are holding up pretty well. And that is despite fake news, which has now become just an epithet, a way for anyone to disparage news coverage they don't like. But don't forget, fake news is real, especially during the campaign and especially on social media. You know, during the campaign, an Oxford University study found that nearly half the news that Michigan voters were exposed to on social media met the definition of propaganda, most of it generated by 
these bots from Russia and, social, and Eastern Europe. So America doesn't always live up to its ideals at home or around the world, but we do aspire to live up to them. That has what has made America more than just a country. It's an idea. America is an idea. We actually stand for something greater than and in addition to our economic self-interest. And when we give up on standing up for democratic values, no matter how imperfect we've been at living up to them at home or abroad, or when we begin to think that all that hard, frustrating work of democracy at home is not really worth it, that's when we get into big trouble. There are so many reasons why we seem to be falling apart. And we see the rise of anti-democratic populism all over the world, sometimes there it's called anti-globalism or anti-establishmentism or anti-elitism, but mostly it's against liberal democracy. And this started a long time before Donald Trump was elected. He was merely the latest expression of it. There are long-term structural problems that gave rise to this anti-democratic populism and made it harder and harder for us to find common ground. And I'll give you just a couple of them. The first one is slow growth and wage stagnation for the middle class. The secret sauce for a healthy democratic capitalist society is broadly shared prosperity and social mobility. And that's about it. You know, inequality is a problem, but people don't mind so much if the rich are getting richer so long as they are too. But for a generation, wages have been flat for the middle class. And just as an example, in 1967, the wealthiest 1% in America controlled 27% of the total wealth. Now they control 42%. A lot of this is because of globalization and technical, technological change. Globalization is inevitable, but too little has been done for its victims. And that's why you hear so many people say that Donald Trump is the wrong answer to the right question. He zeroed in on the way that our economy wasn't working for everyone. The other big reason for this, uh, why we feel like we're falling apart, is that America is changing demographically and there's been a backlash to that. We are fast becoming a majority-minority country. We've already had the first majority-minority kindergarten class. And for a white working class man whose factories closed and who's working at Walmart, that kind of change is an easy scapegoat. And you can see the toll this is taking in attitudes about higher education. A brand new Pew poll, I'm sure some of you saw that this week, showed that 54% of white working class voters saw higher education as a gamble, not as an investment. You know, the American dream used to be a rock solid faith in the idea that if you worked hard and got an education, you could make something of yourself, and more importantly, then your kids would have a chance to do better than you. And that really is gone in many parts of the country. And Donald Trump is the first president who got elected after saying that he, quote, loves the poorly educated, and who never talked about the importance of education you know, on the stump. We, all, <clears throat> we also know that trust in institutions is way down. Congress is ranked in the teens. Uh, government in general is, has no trust at all. Whatever institution it is, people don't believe in it. And then there's the rest of the world. Um, the, uh, wait, before I go on to that, trust in institutions is way down and President Trump has made another explicit strategy to undermine um, faith in institutions. Um, he's just as he's undermined faith in a free press during the campaign, he also worked hard to undercut faith in the validity of free and fair elections, in the integrity of our ballot system. He said over and over again, the system is rigged. The only way I can lose is if the election is stolen from me. He never committed to accepting the results of the election if he lost. Now this is not the first, he is not the first politician in America to run against the establishment and elites and government. All populists do that. Bernie Sanders did that to a certain extent. But Donald Trump took this to a whole new level. And then there's the rest of the world. When Americans look around the world, it looks like it's on fire. 
and it seems as if the world's greatest superpower is powerless to do anything about it except get involved in endless, fruitless wars. So all of that is a recipe for political volatility and the fraying of our common bonds. The last five of six national elections were change elections, and by that I mean party control of one or both houses of Congress or the White House changed hands. The only recent election where the status quo was returned, in other words, the same party controlling the House, Senate, and the White House was 2012. So voters keep voting for change, but they don't get the change they want. They want problems solved, education, the economy, the environment, the tax system, but nothing seems to get done. And there's another reason for that, another reason we can't find common ground, and that's because America is way too polarized. This is a huge problem. You see it in Congress. There used to be conservative Democrats and liberal to moderate Republicans. I mean, it sounds bizarre to talk about that kind of thing now, but together, and many of them came from Pennsylvania, both conservative Democrats and moderate Republicans came from Pennsylvania, and together they made up the center of the political spectrum in Congress, and that center is where deals got done and where common ground was found but that's not true anymore. There's just a big abyss between the parties. There's no overlap. Most members of Congress live in safe districts. The only thing they worry about is a primary challenge from the left if they're a Democrat or the right if they're a Republican. And this is not just gerrymandering, although that plays a big role. It's also because of a phenomenon that sociologists call the big sort. Americans have sorted themselves out so they live in more homogeneous communities. People tend to live near other people who look like them, think like them, vote like them, worship like them. For all the diversity in America, and America is getting more and more diverse by the day, there is a tremendous amount of self-segregation, and I don't mean just racially. On social media, you share and like and retweet people you agree with and you ignore or you unfriend or you block people that you don't agree with. You know, we, I talked about facts should come before opinions instead of the other way around. Well, there was a new poll out just today. 77% of Americans told the pollster that they were willing to change their beliefs when presented with new facts, but only 53% of them said others would do the same. Hmm. That's kind of like I'm asking for a friend. Um, I've always wondered why in the debate about global warming, why can't both sides agree that global warming is caused by human activity and then lead, come to different opinions, like it's too expensive to do something about it. It's not worth the cost to the economy. That's legitimate, you know, or if you're on the other side, we should do something. But why try to delegitimize the science underneath it? Why not just come to a different opinion? Why are people so scared about science and facts that they have to try to destroy them? The other problem in our big sordid society is that people tend to consume media that agrees with them. And it's not just consumers of media that are polarized, it's the media itself that's polarized. Fox and MSNBC don't even cover the same natural disasters. <laughs> I'm the exception to that rule because I'm on Fox and NPR and I don't say anything different on either of them. But our politics are so tribal now that right before the election, a poll was taken among Wisconsin Republicans and they were asked how they thought the economy was going and they said the economy by large margins was terrible. A Couple days after the election, won by a Republican, of course. They were polled again on the economy, and voila, the economy had gotten a whole lot better in just a week. A majority of Republican voters thought the economy was doing really, really well. So it shows you that American politics is becoming reality resistant. It doesn't matter what the issues are or what people think about the issues. You just stick with your team, your tribe, your party, no matter what. And you know, during the campaign, Donald Trump famously said, I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and not lose any voters. And I think he was about right. He always is boasting about how strong and devoted his base voters are, and they are. Um, partisan identity is the most important identity right now. 
A Pew poll taken recently showed 47% of Republicans and 33% of Democrats said they'd be very unhappy if a child of theirs married someone from the opposite party. We know from other Pew polls that Democratic voter hatred, yes, hatred of Republicans and Republicans' hatred of Democrats have both grown from like 16% 20 years ago to about 40% today. That is literally the number of voters, Democrats and Republicans, who will say that they hate each other. That is how tribal we are. And what's so interesting, this President Trump has used tribalism as a political strategy. He has focused meticulously and almost exclusively on his base since he got into office. He was a minority president. He only won 46% of the popular vote. But he seems to think what worked for him, boosting the turnout among white working class voters in just the right states, can work again. Now, politics used to be, has always been divisive, but it's supposed to be about addition, not division. There are so many other indicators that things are falling apart. It's hard to remember that just a few weeks ago, someone shot a member of Congress at a baseball practice. And at that time, after Steve Scalise, who is still in the hospital, Members of Congress, of course, in the past have been shot by deranged constituents before. But this time, because it was so close to Washington, just over the river in Alexandria, people felt for a fleeting moment that maybe something could change. Maybe we've just had enough. The, the excessive rhetoric, the extremism has just gone too far, and we've got to do something about it. And people started calling to tone down the political rhetoric, turn off the professional outrage machine, and many people thought that that event would be a tipping point, the kind of end of, the, of partisans making anger into an industry. I think for the most part that moment has passed, but I hope that it left some um, lingering effects in Washington. So there's also too much apocalyptic thinking. If my opponent wins, it'll be the end of the world. You know, during the campaign, there was a group of conservative intellectuals who tried to come up with some kind of an ideology they could call Trumpism. Um, they wanted to give it some heft, some weight. You know, most people, who, most people who run for president have some clearly thought out ideas and policies. Donald Trump had some instincts. Anyway, there was a group of them, and they, they wrote a series of essays. And one of the essays was written by an anonymous author who used a pen name, and it was called The Flight 93 Election. And what he said was, the country is so bad off that we have to storm the cockpit. You know, this happened in Shanksville, not that far from here. We have to storm the cockpit even if the plane crashes. And that was the rationale for voting for Donald Trump, even if he was offensive to conservatives and Republicans in many ways. Things were so bad, this was our last chance. Even if we go down in flames, we have to give this guy a chance. That is a pretty apocalyptic view of the election. The author of that essay is now the spokesman for the National Security Council at the White House. His name is Michael Anton, and he's a perfectly nice guy. But he really did epitomize a kind of apocalyptic thinking that we have too much of in this country. So what do we do about this? I am actually going to offer you a list of suggestions, and then we can open it up for Q&A. So I know that the centrifugal forces seem overwhelming and inexorable, but I actually believe they can be overcome, or if not overcome, at least they can be mitigated. I think that democracy and civic virtues and de democratic institutions can be protected, but it will take constant vigilance and never-ending participation on every single one of us. So some of these ideas are more serious than others, but first of all, get out of your safe space, stop talking only to people who agree with you. As someone who was once president of the United States said, if you're tired of arguing with someone who disagrees with you on the internet, how about talking to them in real life? You can start by being a better consumer of news and learning the difference between fake news and real news. Start consuming news from sources that you don't automatically agree with. And if you don't like fake news, if you don't like alternative facts, well, it's your job to be able to tell the difference between the two. So look at different sources, look at aggregators of news, 
There are websites like Real Clear Politics that will basically curate everything on the internet for you on any given subject, and you can go see the Breitbart version or the MSNBC version. Um, websites that link to information from all different sources are a great resource. Also, learn about who makes the decisions on your behalf. I'm sure all of you are pretty involved uh, locally, but make it a point to go to a city council meeting or a town hall meeting if your congressman is brave enough to hold one. Um, you can vote, and you do vote, so you should be there. Second thing, next thing, run for office, run for school board, run for dog catcher, run for city council. And this is something to tell your kids. Join a group. It can be political, but it doesn't have to be. Just join some group that meets regularly, anything. A gamers group, a bowling league, ultimate frisbee, a book club. Register voters. Join a basketball league. Volunteer. Just do something on a regular basis with other people. A surefire way for democracy to die is for all of us to be sitting alone in front of our screens. And you're a heck of a lot more likely to believe in a conspiracy theory or a piece of fake news or a crackpot theory on the internet if you have no one else to check it out with. Remember when Trump said during the campaign that he knew someone was a terrorist because he'd read it on the internet. So if you read some fake news on the internet and then you go out to your book club and you tell your friends about what you just read, they might give you a reality check like, hey dude, that is totally false. <laughs> But if you spend all day in front of your stupid screen, especially in an election year, you are more likely to be reading what Vladimir Putin wants you to believe. <laughs> My next suggestion is to advocate for civics curriculum, K through 12. Young people have, I have been trying to do this at my kids' school, probably to no avail, but young people have absolutely no idea what democratic institutions are. How are they supposed to know when they're being eroded if they don't know what they are in the first place. And I have been into my kids' principal's office many times since the election, haranguing them about this. I want them to say the Pledge of Allegiance in a progressive private school. Ooh, why would we do that? Just do it and argue about it and then figure it out. The more common civic rituals we can participate in, the better. I would also support re, re restoring the draft, or at least compulsory national service for men and women with a non-military option. Advocate for more economic diversity on college campuses, not just racial diversity. And here are two, my two goofy suggestions. If you are protesting Donald Trump, carry an American flag in addition to, or how about instead of a pink pussy hat? Um, wouldn't it be great if the pictures of the demonstrations were just a sea of American flags? If you are a young person, a young conservative graduating from college, move to New York or California. Don't move to Texas or Arkansas. If you are a young liberal graduating from college, do not move to New York or California. Move to Texas or Michigan or Wisconsin. Um, so I just want to quote um, James Comey, who testified, and he said in his closing statements, he said a really wonderful thing about democracy. He said, we have this big, messy, wonderful country where we fight with each other all the time, but nobody tells us what to think, what to fight about, what to vote for, except other Americans, and that's wonderful and often painful. And he went on to say why it was such an incredible tragedy and such a huge breach of our democratic culture that Russia had tried to intervene in all of those ways. So I would say that in the end, finding common ground is about patriotism. I think we are at a first principles moment in American history. This is way beyond party or partisanship or electoral politics. I think it is a patriotic act to recommit yourself to civic virtue and to being the best citizen in the best democracy the world has ever seen to exhibit the kind of behavior that will lead us to find compromise and solutions when necessary. We are never going to have a kumbaya society, nor should we. We have deep, deep disagreements. But if we lose the ability to solve them in a civil way, we will lose our democracy too. So let's keep fighting and arguing with each other, but maybe we can do it with a little more respect and restraint. Thank you. So I'm happy to 
answer any of your questions about anything. <laughs> Sir. A man who was much wiser than I one time told me, he was a uh, uh, county commissioner in Pennsylvania for many years, that uh, good government is the art of compromise. And one of the things that uh, worried me during the election is that Donald Trump had never held uh, any political office. President was the first thing he did. Uh, do you think that this is a problem uh, for him, that he does not understand uh, that uh, good government is the art of compromise? And in fact, many politicians today don't understand that. Sure, but that's like, I don't even know if I'd put that at the top of the list of his problems. <laughs> but yes, it's definitely a problem. He's not interested in governance, but the premise of your question is that he doesn't want to compromise. He'll compromise anything. He doesn't have any fixed positions. He's going to sign whatever the Congress sends him. So it's, it's, it's that he's disinterested more than he's uh, inexperienced, I think. Wow. Yeah. How long do you think Trump will remain in office? That's such a good question. How long will Trump remain in office? The interesting thing about that question is there is a lot of magical thinking out there, especially among liberals, who think he will voluntarily leave because he doesn't like it, because, or he will be impeached. My answer to that is, by who? Republican Congress? No. He will be, somehow the pressure will get to him, he's 70 years old, he's a walking invitation to a stroke, you know, he's overweight, blah, blah, blah. I think that he will either be in office for another three and a half or eight years. And I think the only way to get him out of office is to elect Democrats to the Congress and then right. vote against him in the next election. That is the most logical, if you are betting, that's what you should bet on. All the other stuff is magical thinking. Right. And um, I think, and that puts tremendous pressure on Democrats. You know, Democrats in the last election thought Donald Trump couldn't win. Don't forget, there's been a failure of imagination about Donald Trump at every step of the way. The first line of defense was the Republican Party. They didn't want him to be the nominee, but they had a failure of imagination because they could have never imagined that he would actually get there. The, re the, the, the attitude on the part of Republicans during the entire primary was, I think I'll take two aspirins and lie down, and then when I get up, he'll be gone. And he never was. And then there was a failure of imagination on, in the general election that somebody like him could never possibly win. Well, of course they can, because they have all around the world and at various points in history. And so I think it's a real failure of imagination to think that he couldn't last three and a half years. He's already filed for re-election sooner than any other person. He's, he, he is animated by winning and competing. And the campaign, I think, was kind of a high point for him. I think a lot of this is, as he puts it, who knew healthcare was so hard? Something like, what did he say the other day? The hard, it's, even, it's almost as hard as Middle East peace. Um, so I would say that, you know, look, I would say this is, everybody who thought that this would be easy has gotten a wake-up call, and um, people have to get involved, they have to work hard, the Democratic Party has a tremendous responsibility, and my big question as a journalist is whether they are capable of harnessing the organic grassroots enthusiasm that's out there um, you know, in, uh, in favor of an alternative to, to Trump. I don't know the answer to that question yet. Um, but if I were betting, oh, and here's another thing to really depress you. Um, in our lifetime, only two presidents have lost re-election. Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush. And usually presidents, you know, you either have a bad economy, some kind of an outside shock like the hostages in Iran, you get primaried, you know, both Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush were primaried because they broke in some way with some part of their base. You know, George H.W. raised taxes, he also had a recession. So is Donald Trump gonna do that? I don't know. I'm sure somebody will primary him, but I mean, will he be primaried by someone of stature like Mitt Romney? Probably not. Um, and then there's the question, a big question in Washington now is what would it take for Republicans in Congress to break with Donald Trump? Republicans in Congress are, have a, privately, not publicly, privately have a whole range of feelings about Trump. Disgust, embarrassment, anger, frustration. Um, on the other hand, they remember that he did something 
that was a real feat. And nobody thought he could win, and he did. He won the nomination, then he won the election. They remember what happened to the three Senate Republican candidates who, did, who pulled away from him and broke with him. They all lost. So they have a lot of grudging admiration for his political power, but they are really frustrated, and some of them are downright embarrassed. Now, what would it take for them to break with him more than Ben Sass, Lindsey Graham, or John McCain? Um, they don't really count in this. Um, I think it would take his approval ratings being you know, maybe under 35% for a long period of time, and for them to perceive that he is truly a threat to their own political survival. And that just hasn't happened yet. As I said, his base is very strong and supportive. We don't know how big it is. We think it's shrinking. Um, and uh, they don't seem to care what policies he pursues. They have a transcendent bond with him, and they are a big chunk of the Republican primary electorate. So. Um, it's going to take, you know, it's a hard, long job. People should be ready for that. You talked about stresses on several institutions. Can you say something about the stresses on the institution of voting? Well, that's another whole big issue. You know, Donald Trump said that three million people voted illegally for Hillary Clinton, and that's why he lost the popular vote. There's no evidence of that at all, but he's created this commission that will supposedly ferret out this mythical idea of voter fraud. And um, I think that it's very hard to measure the effect of the current voter suppression laws on the 2016 vote. I think they did have an effect, and there are people like the Brennan Center at NYU who actually try to measure this. And there are people who argue that the number of young people and minorities who you know, were either turned away or couldn't get the right IDs in Wisconsin are greater than the margin by which Donald Trump won by. So, you know, these voter suppression laws, I mean, of course, you know, Republicans will say they're to prevent voter fraud, which nobody has proved has existed, and Democrats will say their, their, their goal is to suppress the demographic groups that are growing and that are the biggest threats to Republicans, young people, newly naturalized citizens, minorities. So I think that they, that's been successful. The, the, uh, that, so that's one threat. The other threat is whether the Russians actually can mess around with our ballot systems. And one of the things that they did do, uh, one of the, they, they did four things to meddle in our elections, but one of the things they did was to breach these voter files in a you know, couple dozen states. And although nobody thinks they changed any votes um, or changed, messed up the registration so much that people might have been turned away, one of the interesting things they did was they left a lot of footprints almost as if they wanted people to know, they wanted the US intelligence community to know that they'd been in there. And the, the, the theory behind that is that at the time when Barack Obama learned about Russian meddling in the election, the fact that they'd hacked and weaponized the DNC emails, he was afraid of calling them out and punishing them during the election because he thought then they would attack the ballot process. And you had Donald Trump on the stump every day saying the vote was rigged and if he lost, it would only be because it was stolen. Now at that time, of course, the Obama administration thought that Trump was, would lose. What they were afraid of was him you know, not accepting the results, calling upon his supporters to riot. Who knows what he, they thought he would do. But they were nervous about that. So that's another potential threat. Um, you know, so these are all things to, to, to watch for. But that, look, the integrity of the ballot and the um, validity of our, our election systems is a really important democratic institution. And our trust in that was, was diminished during the last election, and Donald Trump explicitly set out to diminish it. Oh, deconstructing the administrative yeah, right, state exactly, and the deep exactly. state. And yet he's putting in lobbyists and so forth and very key agencies. Yeah. Um, how do we, uh, you know, uh, defend ourselves against what well, they're going to be doing? Well, you know, one of the interesting things was, um, you know, this, this idea of the deep state, the bureaucracy. It basically means the bureaucracy doesn't believe in our mission. And so, so in some ways, they're just merely leaving these, these uh, positions unfilled. 
you know, like the State Department is going to be radically downsized, the EPA is going to be radically downsized. So there's just simply not going to be people in there, or they're just going to be told to do different jobs. You know, the EPA has totally, totally changed its mission to be, um, you know, to be more, more um, friendly to the fossil fuel industry. And that's something, some of that, you know, one of the things I always say is my job as a journalist is to try to separate out the merely outrageous from the truly consequential. Some of these things are something that any Republican president would do. It's not, it's not a subversion of democracy to say that you're pro-fossil fuels. That's like a totally mainstream position in the Republican Party. That's, that's not like outrageous. Now you might not like it, but you know, but, but I think that the question is, um, because of the way that Donald Trump sees his role and sees the presidency as tech, it's technically and legally immune from any kind of conflict of interest rules, any kind of corruption prohibitions, he feels that he can pretty much do anything. He doesn't have to divest, doesn't have to show his tax returns. And the question I have is, over time, what does that do to people's view of government? You know, he ran saying the system is corrupt. Everybody's corrupt. So if everybody's corrupt, like you should just stick with the, the guy that you like, even if he's corrupt too. You know, everybody does it. That's the same way he's excusing Donald Jr.'s meetings with the Russians. Oh, everybody would do it. It's just oppo research. Um, so you want to you pick the crook that you like and stick with them. Um, that could do damage over time. But I think in terms of what he's doing with the federal bureaucracy, those are things that, you know, that another administration could, could repair, change, whatever, depending on your point of view. Um, I found a quote, and after eight years, let's say, of Donald Trump, um, I wonder if we'll get to this point. We find it hard to believe that liberty could ever be lost in this country, but it can be lost. Will be if the time ever comes when these documents are regarded not as the supreme expression of our profound belief, but merely as the curiosities in the glass cases. Mm -hmm. That came from Harry Truman, December 15, 1952. <coughs> if we are we going to lose our democracy, or will our laws? You say there's nothing they can do to get him out. Well, yes, you can do something to get him out. You can vote for his opponent. I mean, I'm just saying you have to do it the old-fashioned way. You can't think that some kind of deus ex machina, you know, Bob Mueller is going to descend from the ceiling and wave a magic wand, and he's going to say, oh, I'm leaving, you know. Watergate didn't happen overnight. Yes, Watergate didn't happen overnight. Oh, this is going to be a grinding process, and I don't think we should expect to hear anything from Mueller until well into next year. So in terms of are we going to lose our democracy, I, look, what I just said to you is I feel like our democracy is undergoing a stress test. We're going to find out how strong our civic institutions are and how strong our de democratic culture is. We're going to find that out. We're living through a really historic period. You know, a lot of times I feel like, I feel like it just isn't fair. My mother lived through the 1930s. Why do I have to live through this? <laughs> you know, isn't it enough that my mother lived through the 1930s? But, um, but anyway, the point is, we all have a responsibility. It's like any person who vote, who stayed home last time or voted for Gary Johnson or Jill Stein, they have a responsibility. And you know, I was telling my, um, you know, at dinner, I've heard these stories about um, women, middle-aged women who come up to Hillary when they see her in Chappaqua or in New York at the theater and they're dragging their 20-something-year-old daughter and they say, she has something to say to you, apologize, you know. <laughs> <laughs> for staying home or not voting, I'm not quite sure what it was. But I mean, you know, look, everybody has a responsibility. Um, apparently, 11% of Donald Trump's voters thought she would win, so they just decided to vote for him. Um, a lot of people thought she would win and they stayed home. So I really think the answer to your question is no, not unless we let it go. We, it's not some inevitable thing where we're just passive and our democracy is going to disappear. Look, there's no doubt it's under threat, and he's not someone who believes he has a he has a kind of sincere natural affinity for authoritarian rulers. Um, he's never talked about democratic institutions or values around the world. He does talk about America first and freedom and God and faith and country and family, like he did in Poland. 
So he's, he's a real, he's really outside the norm of what we think about as a democratic, I mean, not as an American democratic leader. But what happens to our democracy, it's up to us. It's not up to him, it's up to us. Absolutely. And you said, and of course we all agree that people should talk to other people with different opinions, but do you think that the truth with a small c is necessarily halfway between the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center and the NRA? No. And, and with that answer, oh. uh, how should we then follow our talk to people of other oh. opinions? Okay, well talking to somebody, look, if you got, like I said about global warming, wouldn't it be great to have a conversation about global warming where you accept the 99% consensus of scientists, and apparently this has been the case for like decades about human uh, activity causing global warming. If we just agree on that, and then, say, and then I think it's legitimate for somebody to have an opinion to say, okay, I believe that, but I'm not willing to pay the price. I think it's too much stress on our economy to have to make these changes. It would cost too much. It's not fair. India and China aren't doing it. Whatever, that's his opinion. And, but, but, the, but what I think is dangerous is when, because you have a different opinion, you go out to delegitimize the, the underlying facts. You know, the fact that Scott Pruitt right now at the EPA wants to have a kind of red team, blue team debate about whether humans contribute to global warming, as if it's up for grabs. It's not. I mean, look, the Earth is round. That's just the way it is. You can have a different opinion about what we should do on Earth, but you've got to start somewhere. Um, I think that um, you know some of these debates don't have an easy consensus or 99% of scientists agree. If you talk to the NRA, they have an interpretation of the Second Amendment that's you know just different than, than other people. But I think it's worth talking to people of different opinions. There are some people who are so, maybe so extreme that it's not worth it, but um, I think that there is a problem that we're all in our own separate silos and don't talk to people who differ from us. And that's why I think um, people had a failure of imagination about Donald Trump because we're so um, stratified and pe educated people who live in diverse urban communities don't ever talk to white working class people who live in these towns that have been decimated by globalization and technological change. And I think it would be good for people to, you know, to talk to each other more. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, first, I want to thank you for sharing your delightful experience. Thank you. They're anonymous. They're anonymous. Okay, so there's a lot of different things. You know, f fake news became an epithet, right? First, fake news was a real thing, as I said. Fake news was real. It was fake stories planted on in the, um, you know, by uh, social media bots into just the right Facebook feeds of people in the right precincts in the Midwest. Those Russians are really good at U.S. political, you know, operatives. Or maybe they had some help from the Trump campaign. That's something that's under investigation right now. But in terms, of, so so their leaks. Now a leak is generally considered something that's illegal, like leaks of a class of, of classified information. That's wrong. That's illegal. Donald Trump is constantly talking about leaks, but he conflates his own extremely leaky White House, filled with people who are insecure, angry mad at their coworker, ratting on them with an actual national security leak. So the people, the, the, when you read the article and it says, you know, an anonymous source in the White House says the president is seething, that's someone in the White House who told the reporter that the president was seething, but he can't use his name because he'll get fired. You know, I mean, how do we know that the president is very 
um, it's very common for him to talk, have people come in to visit him, and he'll say to them, with his aide standing by, gee, who do you think I should replace him with? You know, or who do you think would be better than Sean Spicer? Or sit there and watch TV and look at somebody on Fox and say, oh, she'd be a better press secretary than you. In other words, we know this because people tell us. People who visit him, friends of his who go to the White House, they talk to us. They talk to us off the record or, or on background, which means you can't identify them. Now, and that's who those people are. Now, what's really interesting is this week we had something and it wasn't a leak and he didn't call it fake news and he didn't call it a hoax. It was an actual email to and from his son that explained in very clear language how willing the Trump campaign was to accept uh, you know, information from the Russians that would hurt Hillary Clinton. So we know that, that's not a leak. You know, they put that out. But that's, that's the, the rule of thumb is, if they say anonymous source, or on background, or off the record, it's just somebody who, who wouldn't, give their, wouldn't give their name. Now, a lot of paper, I think the Times and the Post do this. They say, this person requested anonymity to be able to speak freely. And that's what it is. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Okay, I think in Eastern Europe they have been successful. France happened after us. So they, ha they were really forewarned. And apparently what Macron's campaign did is he put all sorts of fake stuff in, in, his, in the emails so that when the Russians got it, that they had no idea what was real and what was fake. So, so there are ways to protect yourself. Nobody will ever use a Gmail account again. I mean, this was just kind of, this is the first time this had happened. You could make the argument that they never should have used it in the first place. They were very lax. Um, look, the Russians are really, really good at this. And as, you know, this is the case with all kinds of software, computer security. You know, as your security systems get better, the hackers get better. And it's a never ending, it's like an arms race. But, um, but France had our experience to benefit from. And also, I think what they did is they were able to, the Hillary Clinton campaign didn't really understand what was happening as it was happening. Whereas <coughs> in Europe, they're able to stand up and say, every day, I think, the press secretary for these campaigns would say, here are the 10 fake Russian planted stories you're seeing in your news feeds today, people. Here's what they are. You have to have a kind of, you have to have a prophylactic system and then you have to have a way to, to call attention to them. But, it's hard. I mean, nobody knew what was going into the Facebook feeds of all these people in the, just the right precincts in Ohio and, and Michigan, you know, all this fake news. I mean, we heard about some of it. You know, we knew, I think we knew about the uh, fake pedophile ring that Hillary was supposedly running out of the pizza parlor in Washington. Um, but you know what is amazing? After, after the election, we did a lot of stories on this. And some of these were Russian generated. Some of them came from like teenagers in Macedonia. But one guy who generated a tremendous amount of this stuff uh, was interviewed and, and he wasn't affiliated with the Trump campaign. He just said he was just doing it to make money and he said that he did try to put up fake stories about Trump. But he said they, they didn't get any, the, the Hillary, Hillary people weren't interested because they knew it was fake and they just didn't bite. Whereas the Trump universe was totally open to this and because, maybe because they already were kind of consuming media of that sort, you know, kind of sensationalized, like, you know, National Enquirer stuff. So they were more receptive to it and he made a lot more money selling the fake Hillary stuff to the Trump universe than he did selling it the opposite. That's why Trump got up and said, I love the poorly educated. You mean Citizens United? Yeah. yeah, well, look, Citizens United is a huge, oh, pardon? Yeah, well, Citizens United was a hugely consequential campaign finance ruling by the Supreme Court that undid the campaign finance rules 
And now you can have unlimited, anonymous, people call it dark, money going into campaigns. And even though Donald Trump did not spend a lot of money, personally, his campaign, um, the amount of money that, was on the that is on the Republican side is just tremendous. And that's the other thing about reelecting him. Like, that's what I mean, the first line of defense was the nomination and Republicans, the Republican Party failed. Once he got the nomination, every step beyond that was much harder because <clears throat> he did get into office just by a tiny margin. But next time he runs, the kind of structural advantages the Republicans will have and the, re and the resource advantages they will have will be tremendous because of Citizens United. You know, Democrats have billionaires too. They just don't have as many. And for some reason, and I think this is a real, um, you know, shame on the Democrats for this, Democratic billionaires just won't put up pony up their cash the way the Koch brothers will. Koch brothers have already said they're gonna spend $400 million in 2018. Where's, where's George Soros and Tom Steyer and, and Michael Bloomberg? I mean, you know, Republicans are much more serious about this and the same reason that Barack Obama for all of his you know, successes and achievements in office, no president in American history has presided over a greater loss of elected positions for his own party than Barack Obama. I mean, he lost over 1,000. And I'm talking about Democratic state legislatures at every level of government. There were, Barack Obama presided over a greater loss of Democratic office holders. Right now, there are fewer Democrats elected officials in the country than at any time since the 1920s. Republicans have always paid meticulous attention to every race, city council, state legislature. They pay attention, they turn out in every election. Democrats only turn out their voters every four years instead of every two. I don't know, I mean, there are reasons for that, but their explanation's not an excuse. Um, but that's something that the Democratic Party has to fix. Now, Barack Obama and Eric Holder are starting this thing called the Democratic Redistricting Project, where supposedly they are going to try to re remedy this. Um, I don't know how much money they're raising. Um, I've heard it's not a lot. And the other thing that's really significant is that 2020 is a census year, and that's when reapportionment happens and redistricting happens, and the congressional district lines are drawn, redrawn. Well, last time this happened in 2010, it happens every 10 years, the, Re the Republicans just had the luck, they, they had really good timing, that their big surge when they took over Congress and won whatever was 63 seats in the House in 2010, that happened to be a, a, a census year. So they took over all these state legislatures and governor mansions and they were in position to redraw the lines. And they drew congressional district lines and state legislative district lines that kept their incumbents safe for the next 10 years. And <coughs> Democrats feel if they can't win state legislature races and governor's races in 2018 to be ready for the 2020 census, they'll be locked out for another 10 years. So these are, this is why every single election matters. You know, I say this to, 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 to young people. You don't have to, you can't just vote for president. You can't even just come out and vote for Congress. You have to figure out every single elected position that you are eligible to vote for and vote for it. You know, no matter what it is. I mean, dog catcher, it's like, you have to do that. There has to be extreme civic participation. I mean, and people should think that it's, a, it's an existential, it's a matter, you know, it's an existential threat. You either participate or we lose our democracy. That's what I think. Yeah. Isn't the oh, Supreme yeah. Court go, going to um, consider uh, the gerrymand gerrymandering case this next? Uh, I guess it's this next, because now there's a case, usually gerrymandering is, is, is only considered around race. This one, a new theory that actually um, Elena Kagan has kind of developed is that partisan ger gerrymandering is also a violation of the Constitution. So they are gonna consider that. What they would say about it, I don't know. But you know, the thing about gerrymandering, there are some states that do nonpartisan redistricting. Iowa is one of them, California is another. There are some states that are now going to a top two primary system, a nonpartisan primary. That means Democrats, Republicans, everybody runs uh, in the primary for Congress and the top two go on to the general election. That could be two Republicans, it could be two Democrats. In California, what that's done, even though California is a very blue state, it hasn't changed the makeup of the state legislature. I think it's still two thirds Democratic. But what it has done, and this is a good thing for our theme tonight, is 
it's sending more moderate Democrats to Sacramento because they're not afraid of a primary challenge from the left, because that's not who they're facing. They're facing a big jungle primary of every, all the candidates. So there's been more compromise in the state legislature because, you've, because you did away with partisan primaries, so people are not as worried about being pushed to the fringe of their party. And you know you could you could make the argument. I mean, California is so far away from us; it's almost like a different country. But Jerry Brown, you know, California used to be the ungovernable state. I lived there for seven years. California is like functioning, and I think those political reforms have something to do with it. <coughs> one more question. Okay. Oh, we got two people raising their hands. So. Right. I will. The chair will overrule the floor. <laughs> oh, you, well, I don't care who goes first. Yeah. I mean, how many people didn't vote at all? Yeah, that is really important, and I always know about it, but maybe that's because I'm reading, I'm trying to think, but I mean, every, every election they always say what the voter participation rate is. Um, it, it is out there. You know, that's another political reform. If you, you know, my mother was in the League of Women Voters. That's where I come from. But the kinds of reforms like nonpartisan redistricting, top two primaries, you know, opt out registration where everybody's automatically registered. You don't have to vote and you can even opt out. You know, or, you know, there, there are so many political reforms, and I should have put this on my list, of things that could lead to a, fu a more functioning democracy where people could find more common ground. They happen in other countries around the world. Um, you know, now of course the trend Republicans want to make it harder and harder to vote because they're just staving off the wave that's coming. The democratic, the demographic wave that's going to help theoretically help Democrats, but not just yet, um, and hurt Republicans. That's why they've done all of this restricting early voting and making it harder to register because they're just trying to stave off the democratic forces, the demographic forces that are that are you know against them. Now, Democrats thought that that demographic help was coming, and they, they, were, they were wrong. It hasn't come yet. It's in the future. And you know, the old conventional wisdom was that demography was going to help Democrats, um, and people thought it was there because of Obama. The new conventional wisdom is just that Democrats are too inefficiently distributed around the country, and they're too clumped together in urban areas on the coast. But um, you know, there should be a big move to make it easier to vote. And those, you know, there can be ballot referendums on that. There's millions of things to get involved in that are kind of pro-democratic, non-partisan reforms to be for. Yep. So uh, beyond the stress test, the idea that what that is yeah. kill us makes us stronger. Um, oh, I didn't even think of it that way. <laughs> I was just thinking, are we going to survive or not? Um, <laughs> Besides some of the yeah. specifics that you've already made. Yeah. Um, okay. I will say this. I don't know about long term because when I think long term, oh God, I'm sorry. I'm Jewish, so I'm a real pessimist and I always feel like <laughs> nothing good is going to come of this. But, 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 let me say something positive. And I, because I'm always arguing the positive with my mother, because she knew Donald Trump would win, by the way. Um, and I said, Mom, Mom, no, no, anyway. But, okay, here, okay, here are some positive things. He's at 40% approval, or 37. He's not at 60. Okay, and look what happened in Europe. What we thought was that Brexit and then Trump was the beginning of a anti, a global, anti-globalist, populist, nationalist, illiberal, anti-democratic wave. Look what happened. Marine Le Pen is not the president of France. Angela Merkel seems like she's in pretty good shape. Uh, Theresa May and the Brexiters got a pun big punch in the nose. 
when young people who pretty much stayed home the last time figured the only way that they can express their anger at Brexit was to go out and vote for Jeremy Corbyn, who was left as a corpse after the last <laughs> voting round there. So that's kind of a silver lining. Um, I think the grassroots, organic grassroots enthusiasm that you see around the country at these marches and at these um, town hall meetings, that's a silver lining. I think people are getting a real education in what democracy is, what we have to do to keep it, how fragile it is, how it depends on our own adherence to norms and customs and behavior, not some guaranteed thing that the Supreme Court or somebody else is gonna save for us. Um, when have we ever talked about democratic norms and, and talked about how a president breaks one almost every day? We, nobody even knew what they were. Um, we just had the um, confirmation hearing for Christopher Wray at the FBI director, and you had Democratic and Republican senators asking him, what would he do if the president asked you to do something unethical or illegal? Like, really? Those questions I don't think are, are, are <coughs> Those don't come up at a normal, normal uh, confirmation hearing. So <coughs> I think people are getting a crash course in democracy. Now, whether they're gonna pass the test, I don't know. I think it's gonna be really, really difficult. Um, but you know, the things that happened this week, I don't think this week was a tipping point. I don't believe in tipping points. You know, I don't believe in smoking guns, bombshells, all that stuff. But what happened this week was significant. It was really significant. It might not matter to any Trump supporters. Why do they care? They like Vladimir Putin. Don't forget, the, 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 the right wing of this party has liked Vladimir Putin and admired his style of leadership for a long time. Trump just slid into that slipstream. He didn't invent that. Um, you know, what, what I remember during the campaign, which was an amazing moment, Mike Pence was giving a town meeting somewhere or having a campaign event. And a woman stood up and she was wearing all the Tea Party regalia and the hat and the flags all over and she said, she said, do you know that Vladimir Putin is a Christian? And he said, really? I didn't know that. Yes, and he's saving the Christians in Syria. Now, look, Vladimir Putin has made common cause with conservative you know, social activists all around the world. He's considered to be kind of the keeper of white civilization by a lot of the alt-right. He's allied himself with all these really conservative religious figures in Russia, kind of anti, you know, LBGT um, uh, activists. And, you know, so, so anyway, the point is that um, there's a lot of stuff to, to beat back. But um, I am hopeful. I, I hope that there are other parents like me who are going into their schools and demanding civics education, you know, civics curriculum. Um, especially in progressive private schools. That to me is the front line. I used to say to a friend of mine, another parent, we would stand in the driveway in the elementary school and say there will never be, a, this was before Obama, and we would say there would never be another Democratic president elected in this country until Georgetown Day School requires the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we were wrong because Barack Obama got elected and they still don't require the Pledge of Allegiance. But anyway, I, so that's the best I can do in the optimism department. <laughs>